Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is a day that you have made, and we rejoice in it. Lord, we continue our study of the revelation of Jesus Christ that he gave to John on the island of Patmos so, so many years ago. Lord, we are living in the last days. We are living in those days that John writes about. And we ask you, O oh Lord, to you know, give us the understanding that we need of this word. Because sometimes it can be a little mysterious. But you are the revelator. And so we pray you would reveal what we need to see and need to know. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 4 begins after these things. We have just finished seven letters that uh, Jesus dictated to John that were to go to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And so chapter 4 launches out after these things, after having received and written down those letters from our Lord John says, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard, was like a trumpet, speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Now, we are not told if any amount of time passed between John hearing the trumpet like voice the first time in chapter 1 and this time. But by the wording itself, we know that this vision of the open door in heaven does not precede the first vision he saw. But for some reason, John looks up and he looks up and he sees a door. It is not a closed door. It is an open door, an open door in heaven. And when he saw the open door in heaven, he heard a voice. It was the same voice he heard in chapter 1. So he recognized the voice. And the voice was speaking to him saying, Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Now John could write the letters that he received from Jesus from the vantage point of earth, but to see the things which must take place after this, he had to come up to where the Lord was. He had to have heaven's perspective. Now, there are four things I want to point out from this first sentence. The first sentence being, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. The first one is the word come up here, of course, lets us know that John did not go up to heaven on his own initiative. No, he was invited to go up to heaven by the glorified Lord. Two, he... He is told, I will show you things, points to the fact that, God, uh, that John was going to have to be shown what he was about to see. What he will then write down for generations to follow him could not have any element of suspicion associated with it. Everyone who'd ever read the words he would write needed to know that God, John did not make these things up that he writes down. No, he is being shown what he is to write down. The next word to highlight is the word must. The things John was about to be shown by the established will of God would take place because they must take place. There is no provision whatsoever given anywhere in God's word that the things John would be shown would be optional. No, everything he was shown will take place. They must take place, for God has so ordained it. The words after this lets us know that God has an order to what will unfold, which will not be changed. Everything will take place in its time, in the order God wills it, and nothing and no one can alter the order. After this could also mean that none of the things John was shown could have taken place until after John was shown what those things were. 
Remember from Amos 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 7, Amos 3, 7, there the Lord says, Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. God wants us to know in advance what's coming so that no one else can claim what God does as something they did. By letting us know in advance what his plans are, God shuts the door to all counterfeit claims. In chapter 1 we read that John was in the spirit on the Lord's day when he heard a loud voice from behind him like a trumpet. Now, after being invited to come up to heaven and see what things will take place, he states, Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. I didn't know this, but I learned it this week, that Revelation 4 is referred to sometimes by scholars as the throne vision. And the reason why it's called the throne vision is the word throne or thrones in 10 verses is used 14 times. That's a lot of times. Now, what is also interesting, and I didn't know this until I read it in the commentary, Linsky's commentary, is that this is not a throne room vision. John doesn't see a room with thrones in it. He simply sees thrones. He does see other things as well, but the scene is often thought of by some as a throne room vision because we assume that a throne has got to be in a room. No, not so. I'm reminded of the passage from Isaiah 66, 1, and there we read, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me, and where is the place of my rest? Well, since all of heaven is God's throne, he has no need for a throne room. So, there's no need for us to add one to the text when it isn't there to begin with. But what does a throne indicate? A throne in heaven designates the infinite power, rule, and dominion of the one sitting on the throne. And sitting is not an activity of rest. It's a position from which God rules and reigns over the entire universe. He's not lounging on the throne. He's reigning from the throne. Now I want to read the rest of this chapter. It's pretty straightforward, but I will, you know, in a minute get into some of the details. But let's just read through it. It says, Immediately I was in the Spirit... And behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone, stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each had six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist 
and were created. This chapter is pretty straightforward. It is indeed a description of what John saw when he went through the open door in heaven. John sees a throne. And the one, who, the one he sees who sat on the throne, he is seated on the throne. He had the appearance of, our text says, Jasper and Sardius. The Greek is Iaspis and Sardinos. Uh, but we don't really have any conclusive evidence that it was Jasper and Sardinos or Sardius because a lot of times when you're trying to translate what things are, whether it be trees or, or uh, thrones or, you know, what have you, from one language to the next, it's just hard to pick a word. And so... The New King James Version translates Iaspis and Sardinos as Jasper and Sardius, but we don't know for sure. The point of all of this is, is that God is hard to describe. John also sees a rainbow around the throne like an emerald. It isn't multicolored as we're used to seeing on the earth, and I saw one this morning as I was coming in. I was coming out, you know, closing up my gate, and I saw one in the w window of my car, and I turned around and went, oh, this one that John saw was emerald, so it was green, totally green. So he sees a rainbow around the throne, and he sees 24 other thrones around the throne of God. And there on those 24 thrones, there are 24 elders who were clothed in white sitting on these thrones. Now, elders is the word presbuteros, and it means older or senior. Um, we do know that in the New Testament, in the churches that get established by Paul and others, is they, they uh, designated some people as elders of those churches. But we don't know what the word elder means. Did it mean senior persons? Elder type persons? Um, did they have rank and authority? And that's what made them elder. We don't know. But they were seated on their thrones. They were dressed in white. And the white, of course, indicates purity. Whatever sin, whatever guilt they may have had in their life had been washed clean. So they were without spot and blemish. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And of course, this indicates that they had overcome whatever it was that they faced in life and had been given these crowns by God. These were the ones sitting on the thrones. Now, who were the 24? We do not know. Of course, we look at the 24 and say, well, there were 10, 12 tribes of Israel and there were 12 apostles. So could it just be the apostles and a leader from the tribes of Israel? Well, uh, we don't know, and I would have to say first, no. Why would I say no? Well, because simple arithmetic in that John was alive and he was one of the apostles. There couldn't be 12 apostles sitting on those thrones because John likely would have been one of those. There was doesn't say he saw... He does, it doesn't say he saw 23, and it certainly doesn't say that he looked at the group and said, Hi, fellas, good to see you again, meaning his fellow disciples, okay? Anyway, so um, we also know that from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and the King James Version says voices, but the Greek is phone, which means simply sounds. Okay? So what do the lightnings and the thunderings mean? It's just that it's a display of omnipotence. What's interesting is that John doesn't appear to be frightened by what he sees. When we had... Um, in, in Exodus, when God's people Israel had come out of Egypt and they came to Mount Sinai and they were going to meet with God, God was going to come down and speak with them and so forth, and they had to put a barrier around the base of 
Sinai so that no one could come up even onto the base of the mountain. God was coming down in lightnings and in thunderings and God would speak and Moses would talk with him and everything, these lightnings and thunderings and the people there were afraid. Ultimately they just said, Moses, you talk to God and then come tell us what he said. If he talks to us, we're just going to be toast. So, uh, but here, John doesn't appear to be nervous about anything. So he is listening, he's, he's watching this, he's seeing this, he's seeing display of um, you know, omnipotence, you know, all-powerful display of lightnings and thunderings and sounds. And then he sees seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Does it say lamps? Does it say lamps in the text? Okay. Um, so we have the seven lamps of fire before the throne. And these, of course, that's the sevenfold spirit of God. And remember, we heard earlier that they are before the throne of God so that they can get their instruction, so the spirit of God can get his instruction to go out and do whatever the will of God is on the earth. And he sees a sea of glass like the, before the throne like crystal. And then he sees in the midst of the throne and around the throne four living creatures. Now these living creatures are not joined together to one another as they were when Ezekiel saw living creatures in Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10. Those particular creatures, then they were interconnected together. And, you know, when each one of them moved, well, when one moved, they all moved because they were all joined together. Here, we do not have them joined together. They are separated from one another. They, so they can move separate from each other. They are living creatures. And we are told, you know, that one had, one was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. We're also told that they had eyes, full of eyes, all around, within and around them. And of course that simply means, you know, God can see everything. He knows everything. There's nothing that's going to escape his notice. And they had, each of them, six wings. And these particular living creatures, we are told they do not rest day or night saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Um, because, you know, I read through this and, and I thought, this is pretty straightforward. There's nothing terribly mysterious right now. So why is it here? Well, it could very well be that the reason why chapter 4 of Revelation is here is to give us another glimpse of heaven. I mean, we have a glimpse in Exodus. We have a glimpse in Isaiah. We have a glimpse in Daniel. And so now we get another glimpse, only this side, our side, the, the side after Jesus' death and resurrection. And so, I've never seen heaven, you've never seen heaven, I don't think, I mean, and so, we have a hard time imagining these things unless we are given some kind of a vision as to what heaven is like. So, question... Is the vision God, uh, John was given a vision that begins at the throne of God a reminder to us that everything in all of heaven and earth originated at the throne and that the one sitting upon the throne is the one who is in charge? Could be. I mean, God is God. John isn't being given a tour of heaven. 
you know, that starts on the outskirts and moves closer and closer, and, you know, you can see kind of in the distance a big, great, 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 great light, and, and his angelic, angelic tour guide is saying, we're, we're going get to gonna get to the throne soon. So, no, <laughs> this is not a tour. This is a vision. He's up there to be shown what must take place after he is told what these things should be and would be. What takes place in heaven before and around the throne of God is continual worship. Those living creatures are continually going holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. But when, you know, the elders hear that and they go prostrate before the throne and they throw their crowns down before the throne, they say, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. And so it is that the one seated on the throne is worthy to receive continual worship. And the reason given to us is just really basic. God is worthy to receive all honor, glory, power, praise, worship continually is because He is the Creator. He is the Creator. Now these are the first things John saw upon coming up to heaven. And these are amazing things. But what he sees are subdued compared to what he is about to see. Beginning next week in chapter 5. Amen.